All right, so welcome back. We are now moving on to Unit 2 and Chapter 15. So this one's kind of fun because you get to do an overview of the animal kingdom. And you're going to realize the animal kingdom is so diverse. And that's why I'm having you do some fun, like, um, mini projects with this Unit 2. So we're going to start it off. Um, this is one of my favorite animals. I am a huge giraffe lover. And you'll actually get to do this um, process when I'm talking through these. You're going to have to pick your favorite vertebrate and invertebrate. And you're going to do a short little like presentation on them and, you know, teach me some things about them. And so as you're going through listening to these lectures, um, think about it. It's like, okay, you probably have a few favorites, but you might not realize there might be some new ones out there that you haven't yet discovered. So let's get going. So first off, I ask this question, what is an animal? We talked about the other kingdoms before, so we talked about the archaea bacteria, the eubacteria, the plants, the protists, and the fungi, and we talked about key characteristics about each of them. Well, we are now on to the sixth kingdom, which is the animal kingdom, our kingdom animalia. Now these are going to be multicellular eukaryotes, and almost all of them are going to have specialized tissues, and I'm going to talk about what that is in a little bit. Now, when you're going to notice with some of these, they're going to have like sessile at some point. So when you see sponges, you wouldn't think of a sea sponge as an animal, but it actually is. And it's pretty much sessile's entire life. But at one point in its life, it was mobile. Now, with these guys, they have to be able to ingest their food. So they have to get it from another food source. And this can be living or dead organic matter. Now, you're going to see a wide diversity within this group. You're see carnivores, herbivores, omnivores, or some of our parasites. It's going to be very, very diverse. And we're going to go through the different um, phylums and talk about some of the key characteristics on each of them throughout this unit. Now we are animals. A key thing between difference between the animal and plant was a cell wall. Animals do not have cell walls. That is a big, big difference right there. Now we've talked about reproduction in the last couple of units, and you're going to see some of the simpler ones will use asexual reproduction, but you're going to see with most of them, they're primarily going to utilize sexual reproduction. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more later, too. And then you're also going to see that the offspring often pass through a series of developmental stages. And sometimes you can see that when they go through development, they might look very similar to what they're going to be in the outcome, or they can be completely different. Um, think about caterpillars and butterflies. So there's a lot of diversity when it comes to that, too. So there's a few key things I'm going to kind of hit on that I was just talking on another slide before. So first off is there's complex tissue structure. Now, we will go through tissues a little bit more later on when we get through the body. But what a tissue is, it's just a specialized structure of differentiated cells that can perform a unique function. And with a tissue, you're going to see a collection of similar cells that had common embryonic origin. And on the next slide, I'll kind of explain what that embryonic origin means. Um, when it comes to development, that's more of chapter, I think it's 18. When we talk about it, you'll understand how it's all about position when it comes to how the cell is dividing in these early stages. It will determine what parts of that cell will become maybe the heart later on or the skin. Now, you're going to need various tissues because if you just think about yourself and how diverse you are, or if you look at this image right here, we kind of break it up into four main types. Um, you're going to have your nervous tissue, which is going to make up your brain, your brain, sorry, your spinal cord and your nerves. You're going to have your muscle tissue, which is going to be really important for movement. And that's going to be composed of both your cardiac muscle, so your heart, and your smooth and your skeletal muscle. You're going to have the epithelial tissue. It's going to cover your external and internal surface, so the lining of your G GI tract, your organs, and other hollow organs, and it also composes of your skin. And then you'll have the connective tissue. So this is going to connect one or more type of tissue to one another. So your fat, you know, that padding that we all got after Thanksgiving, the holidays, your bone and your tendons fall in that category. Now, why do we need all these different tissue types? Well, think about how complex we are. You're going to see some quite a bit of diversity in the animal kingdom. And as we get more and more complex, you're going to see the need for more different types of tissues. You're going to need certain tissues for capturing food. Um, depending on how complex their diet is, they're going to need different digestive and accessory organs. 
how they move in the environment, how they adapt to it, and how they go through and just communicate with each other. All of these require different types of tissues. Now, there's different ways that we can go and break them up when it comes to organization. And one way is you can break up in the clades based some just primarily on tissue structure. We're going to use um, taxonomy when we talk about how we break things up, but this is talking about the different types of tissues. Now, when we hit on uh, development in Chapter 19, I'll go through this a little bit more. But as you're going through an early embryo, it's going to have three different types of tissue layers. It's going to be the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And from each of the specific areas of the developing embryo, you're going to have different specific types of tissues develop out of that. So the endoderms, where your lung, your thyroid cells, your digestive tract, the mesoderm is where you're going to see a lot of the muscle cells come from, and the ectoderm is where you're going to see the epidermis and the neurons. Now, depending on the type of organism you are, you might have different types of um, tissue structure. Um, for the very simple ones, our parasaur and our first sponges, our periphera, there's only going to be about two dozen cell types. They're very, very simple, and we'll go through the basic anatomy of those two. Um, the placozoa, those are going to be tiny little sea creatures that look like amoebas. They only have four cell types in their entire body. Um, there are some that are grouped up the cenarian, cenaria, I think I said I'm going to screw up some of these names again. So jellyfish and their relatives, they're going to have very, you know, unique types of tissues that they need for to survive. And then it kind of goes on through each of those. Now, when it comes to these germ layers, some are going to use some of them all through the layer, some are not. It depends on the organism and how complex it is and how, what it needs to survive. Now, as I mentioned, we have to reproduce. And one of the primary forms of reproduction that you see in the animal kingdom is the use of sexual reproduction. So just remember, going back to 1408, um, most animals are going to be diploid. So remember, diploid, that is when you have a co both copies of the chromosomes in your cells. So remember, for you, you are a human. You have 46 chromosomes, which are arranged in 23 pairs. 23 of your chromosomes came from mom, 23 came from dad. So for pair number one of chromosomes, one is from dad, one is from mom. Now, if you only have one copy, you are going to be a haploid. Now, from just recalling, most of the cells in your body are going to be diploid cells, or those we call your somatic cells. Now, a haploid cell only has one copy, and the way we formed haploid cells was via meiosis. So this is how we formed your sperm and your eggs for those gametes. Now, remember, the way that we um, went through and reproduced our diploid cells was the process of mitosis, just to kind of bring those terms back to us. Now, what fertilization is or with sexual reproduction is when we take two haploids and we fuse them together to make a diploid. So we're going to then wind up with a zygote. So we're going to get back to that 2N number right here. Now, you're going to see some differences depending on where the animal lives, how they're going to go through this process. Um, land animals will probably use internal fertilization versus external for those that are primarily found in the aquatic environments. So let's kind of break through it right here. So remember, um, we'll go through this. This is more reproduction, chapter 18 also. The process of making sperm is the process of spermatogenesis, which I know a lot about, about. So this is just making your haploid gametes. And if you're a female, you'll go through the process of oogenesis to make those egg cells. Now, fertilization is when an egg and sperm meet, the magic happens. And this is where we're going to have a 1N and a 1N come together, poop, to make a 2N cell. So the cell is fertilized, goes through the fallopian tubes, go through the zygotes, and it go through these different cell stages to where it eventually forms a blastocyst. This blastocyst will then convert into an embryo and then develop into the uterus, where it will fully develop and then go through birth. And then we have a two an animal right here. Once it's at an adult stage, it'll go through the process of making gametes, and the process repeats over and over again. Now, the flip side of the coin is asexual reproduction, which we've kind of hit on. It's just making a clone of yourself. Now, this can be a disadvantage or an advantage, depending on where you are. Now, one thing about that is it can be a disadvantage because um, you can't adapt to the changing environments, which can be kind of scary. Um, think about, you know, because you're just making clones of yourself. 
Now, it can be an advantage depending on that. Think about bacteria and how quick they're easily able to adapt. But it also can be a disadvantage, too, because sometimes getting a combination of genes might give you a better shot. Now, there's going to be some different ways that you're going to see that animals can use um, asexual reproduction. One is one way is budding and fragmentation, and you're going to see this in those that are pretty much stationary as uh, aquatic animals, like your hydra, your sponges, and all the other stuff. Basically, what's going to happen is you're going to have a part of the parent separate, kind of like butt off right here, or fragment off, and it just goes off and starts a new animal. It's an exact clone of the parent. So here's a little video that kind of shows you that process right now. I think it's of a hydra, actually. Now, another way that's really cool, and I do suggest you watch this video, is the process of parthenogenesis. So this is where progeny develop from an egg only without fertilization. I know that sounds kind of weird, and it's, it does happen more often than you think. Um, these are some animals that use that, your insects, some fish, turkeys, rattlesnakes, some lizards. Watch this video. I think it's about a shark that this female shark was alone in the aquarium and then all of a sudden she had pups, which is kind of cool. So watch this. Really cool. Now I'm going to hit on development a little bit, but we will hit on it in chapter 18. So development is just how the cells of the zygote divide and differentiate into different germ layers. So initially you're going to have that zygote when the egg and sperm come together. And then what's going to happen is we're going to go through a series of mitotic cell divisions. So it's just going to start dividing and dividing and dividing. And eventually you get to this ball cells, which is called a blastula. And inside that blastula is going to be what's called an inner cell mass. It's not really labeled on right here. And what's going to happen in that inner cell mass is where we're going to have that embryonic stem cell pool, which those are like the holy grail for stem cell scientists. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And I think you do a discussion post on embryonic stem cell research. But one thing to notice is it's not growing in size. The cells aren't growing. We're just dividing and dividing and dividing. It's still about the same size, you know, as the zygote was when it was just the egg and sperm joined together. We're just dividing the cells into smaller components. Now, this blastula does have this hollow space in it. And then what starts to happen is the next step, which is called gastrulation. What that's going to do is we're going to see an infolding start to happen. And this is going to be the beginning of the digestive system. So depending if you are a protostome or a deuterostome, either your mouth or your anus is going to develop first. As I mentioned, development can dare vary quite often within these things. I don't know why the images get so blurry. Um, if I do this recordings and PowerPoint, this is totally black and you can't see it. It's just the style that I guess I picked and one of the bad things about Collaborate. So I'm sorry if these words are blurry. Um, you do have the PDF files posted in Blackboard. So development can vary. Now, some of them, the younger, are very similar to the adults. So I have two examples of insects right here. We have the butterfly and then this beetle. Now, in some of them, the younger ones, they just look very similar to a miniature adult. And this will be a process of going through incomplete metamorphosis. Now, other ones go through complete metamorphosis. So if you've ever, probably you're a lot younger, gone through the process of having your little caterpillar, and then he goes and forms a pupa, and then comes out this beautiful butterfly. So development's going to vary between those, but you're going to see a lot of them where the younger can look mostly like the adult. So how do we go through and classify all this? It's a lot going on. And you're going to see this diagram a lot. And I'm going to keep pulling it up at the beginning of each one so you kind of know how we went through this. So if you see this tree diagram, we kind of went through it on the last unit. But what you can see right here, we're talking about the animal kingdom. And how we're going to um, classify all this is based on morphological and developmental characteristics. So the things that we look at is the body plan, the overall shape of the animal. And we're going to see that there's going to be a lot of symmetry that's going to happen. Some of them are going to have an axis, and some of them are not going to have an axis. And that's one way that we can go through and classify. And then we're going to talk about how the layers develop, the tissue layers develop during um, development overall. 
And then we'll talk about, we can further divide it if they have an absence or presence of an internal body cavity, and then if they develop with their mouth or their anus first. So let me go through each of those a little bit. But you'll see this right here. So if you kind of see that, first off, let's break it up by body plan. You know, do they have tissues or do they not have tissues? Um, then they'll go through it here. Are they symmetrical or asymmetrical? Do they develop the internal body cavity or do they not have one? And then so on. So you'll see this on multiple slides. So first off is we can divide them up by body symmetry. So you might see the terms asymmetrical, bilateral symmetry, radial symmetry come up. And I think when you do your presentation, I ask you to identify if they what type of symmetry that the animal has. Now, if it's an asymmetrical organism, it has no plane of symmetry. No matter how you cut this, you're not going to see it be like a mirror image of each other. Um, sponges are a prime example of this. Now, some are going to have what we call radial symmetry. So there is a, a big central point. Like a jellyfish is a great example. I think they're using kind of like a hydra right here, a Medusa-looking thing. And you're going to see these primarily in the aquatic environment. So you, no matter how you cut it on this plane right here, you're always going to be able to get mirror images. There's um, no left or top side, but you do have a top and a bottom. What's unique about these is they can react to stimuli from any direction. Now, when we get more complex, you're going to see that a lot of them are going to follow bilateral symmetry, where they're going to have these left and these right planes mirror each other. So if you just go in through and right through the middle, which I sound that sounds very cruel, you're going to see like a mirror image on both sides. And then these are you'll see like the dorsal side, ventral, anterior, posterior. Now with this, you're going to start to have cephalization, where we're going to have a concentration of these sensory nerves in the head region. And as we go through the more complex, you get more and more complex, you're going to start to see head regions start to form on these animals. Now, one way that we could classify everything is how we layer the tissue. So I mentioned germ layers early on in this lecture. So each of these layers will develop into a specific type of tissue or organ. So the outer layer is going to be called the ectoderm. So it's shown in blue right here. The middle layer is the mesoderm. And the endoderm, or inter endo, think of that as the inner layer that'll be your gut and digestive system and as you go through depending on what layers you have will determine how, well, how complex your tissues are going to be and how complex an organism you can be now there are some organisms that have all three layer germ layers these are most likely going to be your ones that have bilateral symmetry now the ones that only have two are the ecto and the endo layers boom, boom, ectoendo, so they don't have the mesoderm, which is that middle red one. They're going to primarily have radial symmetry. So a lot right here, but one way that we can go through and classify is the presence or as absence of a coelom. So coelom right there, it looks totally weird. That's how it's spelled, but say it like coelom. So this is that space inside the body. Now, it's very important. It's going to be fluid filled and cushions your organs from outside shock. So think about how rough and tough you are. Um, I just saw my nieces and nephews and their toddlers and how often they fall. So that sealant cushioning those organs from all those outside shocks. Now it also has a reservoir of fluids and your or so your muscles can act and helps with movement. And it does help with development and movement of your internal organs. Um, and it goes does work independent of your body recovery. Now, it's going to contain, for a more complex one, our kidney, spleen, and circulatory system within that. Now, there are different types of organisms depending on the type of coelom they have. So the acelomates, which is going to be your flatworms, they're going to have no cavity built within the mesoderm layer. Right here, so right here, there's your flatworm right there. They do have a digestive cavity, which happens to be within the endoderm layer. Now, the eucelomates are you're going to be your earthworms, snails, insects, and they're going to have a cavity that forms within the mesoderm layer. So these have no cavity, these are going to have it. So here's your coelom kind of showing in this peachy color right here. You do not see that one right here. So they both have that digestive cavity in the middle but you're going to have like a partial right here for like your earthworms and stuff right here. 
Now, cytostelomates are your roundworms. So there's going to have a body cavity formed from the mesoderm and endoderm tissue. So technically, it's this fake one right here. Now, it's a fake one. It's not a true coelom, but there are a few organisms that have this kind of tissue layer when it comes to organization right here. And finally, as I mentioned, one way that we can classify is if your mouth or your anus develops first. So depending on that, um, this is when you have that blastula and it goes through this process called gastrulation. Now what's going to happen first is you're going to have a blastopore develop, right? So depending if you're going to be a protosome or a deutosome, determine if that first opening that the blastopore forms is going to be your mouth or your anus. So protosomes become the mouth first. All right, so right here, we see it starting to fold in, and it's going to keep folding in, and then the anus will form the second hole right there. Now versus a deuterostome right here, so here is a blastopore. Boom, boom, boom. Going through right here, and also seeing a coelom develop too throughout that. So what you're seeing is the mouth will develop second. So protosomes, these are mostly going to be your bilateral. Think of your jellyfish and the stuff that are going to fall in this one. Sorry, no, those are your radia. Your deuterosomes, which we happen to fall into, are where we developed our anus first. So, you know, if you ever want to insult someone, you can say, call them a deuterosome. Some probably never outgrow that stage. They just kept that anus first attitude. So you're going to see this most likely in your chordates and the humans. So as with all videos, here are some review ones about characteristics about animals and the tissue development if it kind of confused you, and then credit for my images.